and he teaches courses in modern Japanese literature, uh, manga, and anime. Okay, and um, he received a PhD in Japanese literature from the University of Hawaii and an MA in East Asian Studies from the University of Virginia. Um, he was, has a lot of things, you know, academic things to his credit, and he was, he was recently um, a visiting researcher at the National Institute for Japanese Literature in Tokyo and a recipient of the Crown Prince Akihito Scholarship and, uh, and he also received the 2018 Ian Nish Prize from the British Association for Asian Studies. Um, his his uh, research focuses on literature, uh, including uh, manga and uh, anime uh, that represents, and that's, well, he'll talk about that in the course of some of this. I think that, it, that these things uh, manipulate and play with Japanese history. And he's interested in issues of nationalism, national identity, the historical legitimation of power, and postmodernism. And he also researches early uh, modern popular literature and visual culture. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris and let him uh, tell us about uh, um, our topic today, which is the uh, uh, Japanese woodcuts, which are one of the most value forms of art that we have today. So thank you. Uh, th thanks so much for that kind introduction. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen here. Um, there, can everyone see this? Hopefully. Someone say yes <laughs> or no. Chris. That's good, Chris. OK, great. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, anyway, thank you very much for, for having me. Um, so my, my talk today is um, uh, Bridging with Wood, the Colorful World of, of Japanese Woodblock Art. Um, so I'm going to talk about kind of a, a brief history of um, woodblock printing or, or printing in Japan, uh, and then, um, you know, kind of talk about the, the very briefly the kind of the history that gives rise to this uh, to this, you know, sort of art form, and then I'll I'll, I'll get into talking about the the beautiful, um, you know, landscape prints like the one you see here uh, on this slide that everyone loves. Um, <clears throat> so I'll start at the beginning. Uh, the first example, or maybe I won't. Can I click? Can I advance here? There we go. Haha. Uh, the first uh, example of, of printing in Japan is these Hyakumanto Darani, so these, they're the, the one million uh, pagodas. Uh, so in 770, well, uh, around 770, an empress uh, ordered a million of these little tiny pagodas, these little tiny towers. Uh, <clears throat> and then, you know, they, they were to be distributed to various temples and, uh, you know, other religious sites throughout the country. So this was a this was a kind of Buddhist devotional act, but it was also, of course, a display of wealth and power because you know the the throne was demonstrating it had the wealth and resources to um, uh, you know command all the all the uh, artisans and, and resources uh, that you know were were needed to to make all these. But in any case, um, so if you can kind of see the this little top here would plug into this little hole. Um, but in the hole was uh, rolled up this printed uh, sutra. A sutra is like a Buddhist prayer, as it were. Um, and so this was this was uh, the first example of printing. These prayers were all printed. Uh, interestingly enough, some people have speculated that they they must have used metal plates uh, um, rather than wooden blocks because um, you know a, a a wooden block would never stand up to a million impressions. But we don't know. We'll never know probably because the 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 process of making these was not was not um, you know detailed records were not kept. But in any case, um, this is the, the kind of earliest example of, of printing, one of the actually the earliest in, in the world, not, not the earliest, but one of the earliest. Um, another early example is the, the so-called Otsue or Otsu pictures. Uh, these examples are, are from the, the 18th century, but it goes back to about the 15th century. Um, and uh, basically what these were, Otsu was a, was a, a, a town near, near the capital of Kyoto, um, that was uh, uh, on a lot of trade and pilgrimage routes. So the, the local villagers in, in Otsu sort of um, you know, uh, created this industry 
of, of making these little talisman or souvenir pictures for, for travelers going by. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you know, they, they would sell them you know, cheaply, so they were kind of you know, produced very quickly. Uh, and then, you know, um, um, they, they had like sometimes Buddhist pictures and then later on sometimes kind of funny pictures. Uh, and travelers and pilgrims would, would keep them as talismans and then they would take them home and they'd also serve as souvenirs of, of their journey. Um, so these were, uh, um, in order to sort of make them more, more quickly, the, the black outlines were, were printed using wooden blocks and then uh, artisans would, would paint in the, um, the colors. So these are some of the early examples of printing, but you know, printing really did not, uh, was not sort of a dominant art form. Painting was, was very much more, um, uh, you know, the sort of um, uh, prime way, the, the sort of prime medium of, of expression and, and visual expression. Uh, so here's a, 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 a great example of um, uh, a, a picture scroll. So this is a painted picture scroll. You can see it rolled up in the corner there. And then you would unroll it and you would see scenes from uh, the tale of Genji, which is of course, um, you, may, you may have heard of, it's, it's one of uh, uh, um, Japan's great works of pre-modern literature. Uh, but anyway, this is all you know, painted by brush by hand, it's not printed. <clears throat> and here's an example of um, just kind of how it looks as you, as you go through uh, and unroll a scroll. Yeah. So, um, you know, we, so although we do have these kind of early examples of printing, printing was not the sort of primary form of artistic expression, it was very much painting. Um, painting uh, sometimes in scrolls, sometimes in, um, uh, uh, you know, on walls and folding screens and things like that. Okay, so before I get to the era of printing, I just want to really quickly sort of give you a sense of the, the historical, cultural, cultural kind of, you know, developments and milieu that these things evolved in. Um, so, you know, I, I, I won't go into a lot of detail, but enough to say that uh, the medieval period that you see here on the, on the timeline um, was a period of great sort of chaos. Uh, there was uh, a central government, as it were, but it was too weak to exercise control over the over the the provinces um, and the various feudal lords. Um, and so there was sort of you know always kind of some kind of conflict, some kind of civil war. <clears throat> um, this ends in the late 16th century. Uh, a series of of, of three uh, warlords, basically Oda Nobunaga, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, and uh, Tokugawa. I Tokugawa Ieyasu, uh, kind of one after the other, um, succeed in uniting the country. They, they go and they, they conquer their neighbors and then the, the rest of the feudal lords, they manage to either, um, to either uh, you know, conquer or to sort of co-opt through alliances and things like that. So they, they succeed in, um, in uh, you know, sort of conquering everyone else and, and establishing strong central control, uh, beginning the the, the, the last guy, Tokugawa, so he becomes the first shogun of, of the Edo period. Uh, and we call it the Edo period because uh, he established his capital here. You probably can't see, but in the, in the city of Edo, which we now call uh, Tokyo. Right. Um, <clears throat> but in any case, this begins Japan's, this right around 1600 here, this begins Japan's early modern period. So first of all, uh, uh, the Tokugawa shogun at Seated, where the medieval governments had failed in um, uh, establishing strong central control. So, uh, and this means primarily control over the, the regional lords, right? Um, so, uh, although there were occasional like uprisings, basically this was two, you know, 250 years of, of peace, right? So with that long peace, you get, you get you know, kind of uh, opportunities for economic growth, you get this um, this, uh, you know, kind of explosion in productivity and land reclaimed and, uh, you know, or, or developed things like that. So you, you get the, a real sort of, you know, period of, of prosperity. Uh, one of the ways that he, uh, that, that Iyasu and, and the other uh, subsequent Tokugawa shoguns established strong central control was they required all of the uh, feudal lords, the, the various sort of regional feudal lords who reach in con, you know, control, much like European dukes and earls and things like that, who are in control of their own territories. He required them to spend every other year in attendance at him, uh, on him in his capital in Edo. 
right? So in other words, to keep a watchful eye on them and, and prevent them from consolidating too much power in their provinces. Um, so what this meant was that Edo, which had been basically a swamp town, uh, became a huge urban area overnight because you know at, at any time half the feudal lords in the country were there. They didn't travel alone, of course. They had hundreds or sometimes thousands of retainers that came with them, uh, and servants. And all those retainers and servants needed services. You know they wanted to buy shoes and clothes and go to restaurants and things like that. So commoners flocked to this area to supply those services. And by the middle of the 18th century, Edo was was a a city of a million people, which was larger than the time uh, than, than London or Paris. It was probably the, the largest city in the world. Um, so it becomes a huge urban area. And with urbanization, you get the things that you get with urbanization. You get uh, uh, economic opportunities outside of um, agriculture. You, you get uh, something like a, uh, an urban consumer market. Um, you get increased you know, prosperity. Um, um, and you get increased literacy, and you know they, so you, this this sort of uh, new kind of consumerism, this urban consumer market, uh, by these new, newly kind of literate populace, and they want to consume leisure goods with their new prosperity. And some of the things that they want to consume are things like uh, you know art and literature, right? So this is kind of enormously important. And then the other thing to th to, that I really briefly is that you know kind of a, a knockoff effect of this was all these feudal lords were, were kind of traveling constantly. So uh, very good roads were established throughout the country at this time. Um, and uh, that means that um, yeah, you know, travel became possible because although the roads were meant for the feudal lords, commoners used them too. Um, and so you know, people traveled, they went on pilgrimages. Often the pilgrimages were really just excuses for tourism like we understand it today. Uh, and um, merchants could use the roads. Uh, travel became much quicker and much less dangerous. So you get gains from trade uh, and you know, specialization, uh, increased economic productivity and so on and so forth. So this period is, um, we call it early modern, not because it's modern in the sense of um, you know, like industrialization and, and like electricity and things like that, but it's modern in some of its cultural formations and this kind of early capitalism, proto-capitalism maybe as uh, you, might, you might say, um, uh, and, uh, you know, kind of increased literacy, uh, increased urbanization and a culture that in, in many ways is, is recognizable to us, right? It's, it's no longer this kind of medieval or, or, or uh, ancient culture. Okay, so that's kind of the, the milieu that, um, you know, print, uh, print technology and, and, and sort of print capitalism rises in, in, the, in the 17th century. Um, so, and again, there's all these sort of this increased prosperity, newly literate people, they're, they're looking to buy consumer leisure goods in the urban market and what they're, what they're buying often is, is books and, and art prints and things like that. So uh, some of the earliest printing in the, in the 17th century was actually movable type, the so-called uh, kokatsuji or, or old, old print type. Um, so here's an example of uh, the tale, uh, a copy of the tale of Issei, which is one of Japan's oldest um, um, tales. Uh, <clears throat> and you know, here it is in a 16, well, um, before, sometime before 1610, uh, in a movable type edition. Now you may be thinking, this is not, <laughs> this does not look like movable type. This looks like, you know, handwriting, right? It looks like kind of cursive writing. Um, but in fact, because um, at the time, uh, Japanese was written very cursively. Um, the, 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 the printers made their movable blocks um, in such a way that, try, that they tried to kind of capture uh, this connectedness between characters um, as much as possible. So um, this is one character, Mu. And this is actually, this next block here is two characters, Kashi. And this is uh, three characters, Otoko. Right, so um, they tried to, um, you know, put characters that appear together. They would make them into one block, or that commonly appear together. They would make them into one block. Try as much as possible to, uh, you know, sort of capture this cursive nature of, of, of Japanese writing. This actually comes into Japan, interestingly enough, from two two uh, routes. The first route is, uh, you know, so in in the late uh, 16th century. Uh, one of the guys I talked about, uh, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, actually invades Korea. Um, it was a very uh, ill-conceived campaign. 
it, it didn't really get Japan much or, or uh, Hideyoshi much. But one of the things that the samurai did bring back from Korea was, was some new technologies and including movable type presses. And the other route is actually from Jesuit missionaries, which were very active in the 16th century in Japan. Um, and they brought presses with them that they wanted to adapt to Japanese to, to print Bibles and things like that. Although, of course, as you may know, they were later chased out of Japan. So anyway, um, <clears throat> this technology of movable type is um, uh, in use in the in the kind of early um, uh, 17th century, uh, but it, and you know for, for for several decades, but it falls out of favor actually, um, quite quite differently from its you know uh, the the sort of um, use of the technology in the West, um, <clears throat> and people have have advanced several explanations for this. One is that um, you know, uh, calligraphy was was a very important art in Japan at the time. Was you know one of the uh, the uh, you know sort of distinguishments of the of uh, the lady or gentleman, right? Um, their their you know beautiful calligraphy, <clears throat> and so you know people have said, well, when when people were reading an author, they didn't want to just read his words; they wanted to see it in his hand. Uh, or her hand sometimes. Uh, and so, you know, this sort of standardized type was, was did not accommodate that. The other explanation that I find a little more um, uh, plausible is, is it, you know, this just didn't work with the economics of uh, printing in the, in the 17th century in Japan. Uh, <clears throat> because uh, movable type is really only, really only makes sense if you can uh, assemble the plates print every copy you'll ever need and then disassemble the plates uh, and use the blocks in something else. Um, because then if you, if you had to do a reprinting, then you have to reassemble the plates, you have to do all that labor all over again. So uh, the, at the time in the early 17th century, um, you know, we, can, we had this kind of this budding explosion of prosperity, this budding literacy, but it wasn't quite there yet. And um, uh, the print market just didn't support large print runs. And instead it made much more sense to do very small print runs. And then if something, if something became popular, then you could, you know, reprint it, right? But then if you, if you're using movable type, again, you'd have to reassemble the blocks all over again. So instead what <clears throat> people eventually um, settled on uh, was uh, wood block printing, right? With uh, so-called hangi or, or wooden printing block where the entire page was carved onto one block. And you have an, uh, an example here, text and, and image and everything else um, was carved in relief, right? And the advantage of this, of course, was that, uh, you know, if you, 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 you have, it's a lot of work to carve it out at first, but then once you've done that, you can put those blocks on a shelf. You know, you can just do a few hundred printings, put the block on the shelf, if that book turns popular, uh, you can take the block off the shelf and just, you know, put ink on it again and, and print a few hundred more copies, right? Um, so that worked out well for the for the economics of, of printing at the time. So from about the middle of the 17th century, uh, you know, this this um, you know full page wooden block printing becomes predominant. Um, I have a little video here to kind of show you how it's done. An artist or author would would you know create an image. It would be, you know, pasted onto a block of wood. An artist would then sort of carve a, uh, out that image in relief, um, and then to print, um, they would just brush ink onto the wooden block and put a piece of paper on, and then you know, rub it to create an impression, like this guy is, is doing here. And then you'd get a beautiful, um, uh, you know, image. And then if you wanted to do multiple colors, you'd have you'd have a uh, a separate block for each color. And you can see here he's now, um, you know, putting a different color on. And, um, you know, if you wanted, uh, you know, uh, uh, lots of colors, you just have to have lots of blocks. And you can see how he's assembling it color by color here. And this is, of course, the, the famous great, great wave picture. Uh, so this is the sort of printing technology that, that became dominant by uh, the middle of the, the 17th century. Okay. Um, so now I, I, I do want to get into, um, now that we've kind of talked about the development of printing technology, um, I want to get into some of those beautiful pictures that, that everyone loves. Um, I'll start talking about an early master, uh, Suzuki Harunobu. Uh, by the way, the sort of catch-all term for these pictures is ukiyo-e, or, or pictures of the floating world. <clears throat> um, and um, yeah, floating world is, uh, it, it, it basically re refers to 
the it's it's a tricky term because it kind of refers to the contemporary world, uh, the world of of you know kind of love and um, uh, you know consumerism, the, you know the urban market, things like that. But then of course, uh, eventually the term was also used to refer to landscape prints and even historical prints. Um, so uh, it's it's um, uh, kind of a uh, yeah, it's 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 kind of a, a tricky term, but nonetheless, uh, ukiyo-e is is sort of the, the catch-all term for these beautiful woodblock prints of the of the Edo period. Uh, oh, by the way, the early modern period is also called the Edo period. I don't know if I said this before, uh, because the um, the shogun had his capital in the city of Edo. <clears throat> uh, okay, so here is Suzuki Harunobu. Again, he's an early master. Um, he's one of the first people to um, to master the the nishikie or the brocade prints. So in other words, the the polychromatic, multicolored print. Um, there were there were several people using multiple colors uh, before him, but most of them were using it quite awkwardly, um, and where you'd you'd mostly have like a black and white picture, and then maybe one or two areas of color to kind of create pop or contrast. Um, Suzuki Harunobu was often called the, the first person to really kind of master the use of color. And here's an example, uh, two lovers beneath an umbrella in the snow. Uh, obviously it, it, it conveys right away this, um, you know, this sort of feeling of intimacy, these two people sharing an umbrella. But what's interesting is that, you know, it's, it's almost mon like kind of monochromatic, right? Um, so even though he's using multiple colors, um, the, 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 the predominant composition, the, the, the predominant color scheme is, is black and white, right? The black and white tree, the white snow, the kind of <clears throat> gray background, and then the, of course the, the stark black and stark white clothing on the lovers. It was just little tiny bits of, of you know, color on their clothes, right? And on uh, um, the, the sort of red on the, the, the inside of their kimono and then the, the you know, probably would have been um, yellow maybe originally uh, of their under robes and so on and so forth. So, you know, he, he creates this very kind of intimate composition and then just kind of, you know, uses color very subtly, right? It's not an exaggerated use of color uh, to kind of, to, to give this image some, some dynamism. And it actually, I think, enhances the kind of uh, monochromatic uh, composition of the scene, the, the, the predominance of black and white by, by having a little bit of, of color in there to, to, to show you what color would look like. Um, Harunobu is known for his domestic scenes, his kind of charming domestic scenes. And so here, I like, I like this one. I have two kids myself. So this is a, a picture of, you know, mom is trying to, uh, to change the baby and, and the baby decides to stand up, probably, you know, maybe for the first time <laughs> while, while getting changed. And like the cat is yowling at the maid and, you know, it's just like, it's kind of domestic chaos, right? So it's a very kind of uh, relatable scene for me. Um, um, but anyway, yeah, he's, yeah, again, this is one of Harunobu's kind of signatures, these kind of, you know, charming domestic scenes capturing this, this ordinary domestic moment. And here's another one of his that's interesting. <clears throat> um, reading a, a letter. At the top, there's a poem by this poet, uh, Fujiwara no Asatara, who's uh, a much older poet. He's, he's from several centuries before, very famous though. Uh, and the poem is about, you know, not being able to see your lover, right? So in the, fore, uh, in the, in the, in the, in the picture itself, then we have this, this woman and her maid, and the woman is, is reading a letter, and presumably it's, it's, uh, it's a letter from her lover telling her that they can't meet for some reason, right? Um, so again, a, a kind of very normal moment. He creates a link between this, you know, centuries old poem and, and the modern, uh, well, for him, it would have been modern, right? Modern uh, urban life. Um, <clears throat> and uh, again, this kind of, you know, um, uh, interesting domestic moment just captured for our pleasure. But uh, a few things to note about this picture. Uh, first of all, we have a woman reading, right? <clears throat> and this was, you know, this was accurate. Literacy was quite high in the urban areas, uh, even among women. Um, and that literacy did not extend to the countryside very far, uh, but in the urban areas, at least, literacy was quite high. And in fact, uh, we, we may have been the highest literacy rate in, uh, among women in the world at the time. Uh, although, of course, we don't really, I mean, no one kept good, uh, you know, numbers back then, good statistics, but uh, many people have said it was likely that in urban areas, you had the most kind of uh, literate women uh, population of, of, of women in the world. 
Secondly, um, notice, if you will, how uh, tall and slender his figures look. And this is actually a, uh, this is actually a kind of signature of uh, Suzuki Haranobu. He's, he's famous for these slender figures. <clears throat> but I point it out because um, uh, right away, even from, you know, it's kind of very early master, um, uh, ukiyo-e were never overly concerned with mimetic representation. In other words, with sort of representing the world as it really is, right? Um, creating kind of a photorealistic image. They were much more concerned with a stylized representation or with the kind of impression of the artist. Um, and this became uh, important later on. The other thing <clears throat> I'd like you to notice is if you look, so they're standing on, on tatami mat floors. Um, so there's, uh, you know, these are the, the borders of each mat. Here are these lines. But if you notice, these lines are moving in parallel, right? And then the, the corner here of the, of the wall and then the top of this or, or the bottom of this, this uh, sill here is also parallel with the, with the corner of the wall here. Um, so the, the lines, the sight lines in this composition are running in parallel. And um, this perspective, parallel perspective, also called Japanese perspective, um, was the sort of standard perspective used in, in Japanese art of all kinds. Um, you know, from basically from the beginning of Japanese art, more or less. And of course, this is, you know, heavily influenced by Chinese art, but, uh, you know, it had been, <clears throat> it had been thoroughly uh, um, adopted in, in, in Japan. <clears throat> so why, why uh, use this kind of perspective? Well, if you look at this picture right here, what this guy is doing, he's, he's painting a picture of a bird uh, like a probably a, a mythical bird of some kind. I think it's a phoenix, maybe um, on a, a wall, right? And in fact, walls and um, doors and folding screens and things like that were the sort of primary um, medium for for painting composition. Well, if that's your uh, medium, right? So they, they didn't use canvas. Um, they use you know uh, doors and, and screens and things like this. If that's your medium, then then parallel perspective makes a lot of sense because you can just keep going, right? You can just sort of keep moving the picture out and out and out and building it out. Uh, you know, and that that scroll I showed you, you know, that scroll could just keep rolling on for many many feet, and you could just keep you know adding more onto the picture. Uh, because there is no there's there's no point where the sight lines converge. There's no focal point. Um, you don't have to worry about where the focal point is. And if someone were to, you know, fold back half this screen, you, you know, it, it's, it's not a problem if you fold back the part with the focal point or something, because there is no focal point, right? You can fold back part of the screen and still enjoy the rest of it, um, the rest of the painting. <clears throat> so this perspective was, um, uh, you know, in, in use, again, it was sometimes called Japanese perspective, uh, you know, up to the 18th century. But then in the 18th century, um, artists start to use, you know, what's called uh, linear perspective or point perspective, um, and also became to be called in Japan Western perspective. And in this uh, sort of composition, the, the sight lines converge at a point, right? And this is actually uh, a, a a technique that came from the West. Um, so we've we've traced its its um, dissemination from um, uh, Renaissance era drawing manuals in Europe that went down the Silk Road to China and then eventually made their way over to Japan. Um, <clears throat> so uh, it, was a, it was a kind of technology that uh, I, I think actually Da Vinci was one of the first ones to, um, to, to you know, sort of develop this perspective. It was, it was kind of technology or technique that came from the West, but um, you know, the, the, the Japanese masters uh, definitely kind of made it their own. And of course the, the, the great masters were even able to, you know, to have a, regression point uh, off the page and, and things like that. <laughs> Here's another great uh, perspective print, Western perspective print. It's kind of a segue to the next thing I'm talking about. Uh, but this is a, this is a, a Kabuki theater, right? Uh, and it's a full house. You can see, um, you know, there's all kinds of uh, fun uh, things going on on stage and, uh, you know, just full of, of spectators, uh, you know, having a great time. Uh, Kabuki was was phenomenal at the time, uh, just you know, uh, enormously popular, and um, its its stars were were much like our Hollywood stars. I mean, they were just you know phenomenal celebrities. They were 
uh, fashion icons. They appeared in advertisements. They, uh, you know, they were sex symbols. Uh, you know, women wanted them, men wanted to be them, right? That kind of thing. Um, and uh, consequently, one of the big subjects of, of ukiyo-e is actor prints, right? So here's an example, <clears throat> the actor Ichikawa Komazo. Uh, and uh, here he's, he's, um, you know, he's holding in one hand a mirror and then the other, other hand a sword in this kind of cool pose, right? Um, so one thing that I wanna talk about with this is if you, you know, these were prints, right? Now they're old and rare and very valuable. Well, some of them are very valuable, uh, valuable. but at the time, you know, they, they were printed. Uh, they were, you know, basically consumer art. Um, and if you think about this, our sort of modern equivalent of, you know, a, a printed consumer art uh, picture of an actor, the, the, the modern equivalent is like the movie poster. Right, and indeed, these these prints were were very much like the movie posters of their time. People would, you know, go along the the road and they would see a print of their favorite actor, and they would think, "Oh, that's so cool," and they would buy it, and they would go put it on their wall. Sometimes they were even used to paper over holes in like paper screens. Japanese houses use paper screens, so if there was a hole in one and you didn't want to replace the whole thing yet, you could paper it over with a cool actor print. Right, so they were very much sort of consumable art at the time. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing is, if you notice, you know, he's, he's, he's in a pose, right? And this is a moment that appears in a play. And here's, here's another one. The, uh, the actor Ichikawa Danjiro as the character Skeroku. Uh, Ichikawa Danjiro was probably, probably the most popular actor of his time. Um, and he's holding this umbrella. So this is, this is a moment from the play uh, Skeroku. He comes in and does a little dance and there's this kind of moment where he holds his umbrella overhead, kind of, uh, uh, you know, doing a little pose, revealing his face and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> so these were in many way advertisements, right? Like you would, you would see this, uh, you would see this picture and think, oh man, that looks like a really cool moment. Maybe this doesn't look as cool, but this looks pretty cool, right? He's holding the mirror and the sword, like what's going on? This looks like a really cool moment. I want to see this play. And then you'd go to the play and you'd see this moment and you'd think, Oh yeah, this is just what I wanted to see. Uh, and if, be, if they behave, excuse me, <clears throat> they behave very similarly to um, uh, movie trailers for us, right? You see the trailer, like you think, oh, I, 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 I really want to go see that. And then you see the moment that was in the trailer and you think, oh yes, this is it. My, my desire has been fulfilled. Um, so they were very, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, you know, this is why we call it an, an early modern period because cultural formations were very recognizably modern to us in many ways. Uh, and that was one of the functions that this woodblock art, art fulfilled. One thing I do wanna point out though, is if you look at this guy's face, whoops, that was here. Ah, here we go, zoom. If you look at this guy's face, uh, you know, it's all just one flat area of color, right? Um, you know, there's no shading. You could just, if you were in a paint program, you could just click fill and click and, you know, you'd be done, right? Um, Japanese, um, oh, next slide, please. All right. <clears throat> there we go. Japanese art uh, never used what's called uh, chiaroscuro, which is the, the art of, uh, that was developed in Europe of, of using shading to, um, to sort of um, emulate dimensionality. Right, so here we can see obviously this very famous painting. The light is coming from somewhere over to our left, uh, <clears throat> and uh, so this side of her face is brightly lit, and then her nose is in shadow. This side of her face is in shadow, which so this use of sh of shading gives us this kind of illusion of dimensionality, this sort of three D ishness, as it were, or perspective. But Japanese art never used this technique. Right, they always use uh, what's called flat color. And some people early on saw this as kind of a technical deficiency, but actually this is one of those aspects that, that really uh, excited people later on. Uh, I'll talk about that in, in due course. Okay, all right. So now that I've gone over all the kind of uses of, of ukiyo-e and, and some of the early stuff, let's get to those just amazing landscape prints that everyone loves. Um, and so I'll start where you've, you've got to start <clears throat> uh, basically the famous Great Wave uh, painting, uh, um, actually Mount Fuji behind the Great Wave in Kanagawa by Katsuka Hokusai, who is, you know, probably the most, well, definitely the, 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 the most famous woodblock artist. 
possibly the most the most famous artists in uh, you know uh, from Japan uh, you know outside of Japan. In other words, he's the Japanese artist people not in Japan know the most, um, and he's of course phenomenally you know famous within Japan as well. <clears throat> this uh, painting, of course, is yeah, I mean I'm, you you may well have seen this image before. It's been widely disseminated. It's it's very famous. Um, and uh, it, in, in some ways, it, it, it even represents Japan, right? Like if there's a, you know, an exhibit of something Japanese, you know, this is like the banner image, right? Um, in, in many cases, this has uh, this image has uh, fascinated uh, connoisseurs for centuries, um, and and for good reason, I think. Um, so first of all, you know, it's a it's a picture. Well, well, first of all, I mean, the the thing that immediately pops stands out. It's just this, the, the sort of dynamism of the motion, right? It's this, this single moment, uh, you know, just kind of frozen and snatched out of time. Uh, there's, you know, droplets in the air, there, the, the waves are frothing, uh, but he's, you know, uh, you know, far before, you know, any kind of pho uh, uh, photography was able to do this. Uh, he's able to kind of, you know, just freeze this moment and, and capture this moment of energy and motion and, and dynamism, but in a, of course, uh, you know, a, a, a still frame that can't move. He still gives us an incredible impression of motion. Um, <clears throat> secondly, you know, it's, it's so, so supposedly it's a, it's a composition of Mount Fuji. And this was from a series of, of sort of perspectives on Mount Fuji that he did. Um, and, you know, supposedly it's a, it's a picture of, of, of Fuji, but what's, you know, and it's, it's there, but what's really getting our attention is, is of course, the, the sea in the foreground. And because of the perspective, it almost looks like this wave is about to just wash over Mount Fuji, right? Uh, so we, we know, of course, that Mount Fuji is this incredibly tall and solid, uh, majestic mountain, but it looks, you know, like momentarily, thanks to the trick of perspective, that the, the normally kind of placid, uh, passive ocean has, you know, is so angry, it's ready to reach up and crush Mount Fuji. And then, of course, we have uh, these poor people, right, these, these fishermen in the foreground, uh, you know, who are, who are drawn very, very, um, you know, uh, quickly, almost, right, uh, with a great economy, uh, you know, just kind of a, a, a round uh, face with, with two little dots for eyes. <clears throat> so, you know, first of all, um, their, their, their individuality, um, you know, their expressions, everything about them is, is, uh, you know, thanks to this composition, just, just shown to be very insignificant, uh, in, in face of the, this, the, the power of this roiling sea, of the power of angry nature, right? And we know they must have individual lives and hopes and things like that, but none of that, um, you know, matters in the face of, of, you know, this, this terrifying, uh, you know, sea. And uh, again, we, we have this sort of really dynamic uh, moment and, and we worry, right? Like what's gonna happen to these fishermen? Uh, are they gonna survive this wave? Are they going to be you know, crushed and drowned in the next moment? Are they gonna you know, uh, get through it? Um, and we don't know, right? Um, but it just, it, it just uh, really kind of uh, reaches out and, and grabs us and um, you know, makes us worry about them even as we're uh, really kind of appreciating the, the kind of power of the sea. So this is, of course, the, the, the most famous woodblock print, the most famous uh, Fuji print, but there are others. <clears throat> this is a, an interesting one, Mount, Mount Fuji from the mountains of Totomi. So this is actually the next mountain over, and then you can see there uh, Mount Fuji. Uh, and then the foreground, we have these, these woodcutters, and they're, they're sawing this big piece of lumber into, into um, boards. But what's really interesting about this composition is uh, is that you know Mount Fuji is is you know contained almost confined within this lumber frame, right? So you know busy human industry has has uh, you know uh, contained or confined constrained the kind of natural majesty of Mount Fuji, right? And again, we know that this is this you know sort of uh, powerful towering majestic mountain, but we can almost, and it's there, but we can almost hear uh, the sort of, um, you know, uh, people woodworking in the, in the foreground, we can almost smell the fire they're making, and that, you know, that grand majestic mountain seems to be kind of contained in this moment by, by busy human activity. 
<clears throat> and here's another uh, good one, uh, Mount Fuji um, uh, from Kachikizawa and Kai province. So in the foreground, we have a, a fisherman pulling in his nets. Uh, but what's uh, most impressive about this is, is here's Mount Fuji in the background, but just drawn with incredible economy of line, right? Just, I mean, it's really just one line or maybe, maybe two lines, right? But that's enough to suggest um, Mount Fuji. And it's, uh, you know, again, so, uh, uh, you know, just kind of powerfully there, powerfully present in the background that it rises above the morning mists and it's, it's, Kind of silhouette is 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 visible despite uh, all, despite all the cloud. It's it's poking up above the mist and clouds. <clears throat> uh, the other great master from this period is Utagawa Hiroshige. He's famous for his um, uh, um, paintings the, depicting the stations along the Tokaido Road. So that's what the the Tokaido is one of those roads I talked about. Um, that the feudal lords would, would you know, process along. It was, it was one of the main ones. And of course, you know, uh, commoner travelers were using it as well. And along this road, you know, every few miles, there were villages where, where you know, that basically popped up to, to serve travelers. Um, and, uh, you know, you could stop at an inn and get a bite to eat and so on and so forth. So here, you know, um, it's, it's, it's dusk. Um, the, these, there's a couple of travelers along the road, road here, and there's these two maids from, from an inn are, 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 are fighting over the customers, right? You know, fighting over these travelers. Maybe it's been a slow day and they're, you know, there's, they, they, they need more customers to break even. And here come along the last travelers of the day and they're saying, no, come to my inn, no, come to my inn, right? Um, so uh, that's, you know, it's kind of a funny composition in the foreground. In the background, of course, what's really striking is, is you know, this, this monochrome, uh, you know, kind of charcoal use of color to, to um, indicate, you know, darkness. Uh, whereas in the foreground, uh, you know, where, where there's light coming in from this, from this uh, inn, uh, you know, we, we have, you know, areas of color, right? But we have this very stark kind of charcoal gray composition of the, of the, um, um, uh, the other houses. And uh, Hiroshige is, is famous for his use of light and color. Here's another great example, uh, fireworks from the Ryogoku Bridge. Um, so again, <clears throat> he's captured this, this moment of fireworks going off, um, you know, snatched out of time, but, uh, you know, the, the sort of use of light and dark, the composition uh, here, the, 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 the boats are just kind of mere shadows, outlines on the, on the, on the water, uh, the bridge, you know, everything is done very dark, uh, uh, gray colors. But then if you look here, uh, you know, the, the, there's people in their, in their pleasure boats lit by lanterns. Uh, and you can kind of, you know, see, in, see into their kind of warm little world or their warm little lit world that exists kind of floating amidst all this, all this darkness and shadow, right? You can barely see their figures outlined there. And I don't know if you can see that well on Zoom, but if you look here uh, in this big, you know, dark black area, you can actually see the, the, the wood grain from the block that was used to print this. Um, and, and here's another great Hidoshige print. <coughs> um, Morning Fuji from Hara along the Tokaido Road. So this is a, that same Tokaido Road. In the foreground, you have two women traveling with their, with their servant who's carrying some luggage. <clears throat> and and women traveling uh, again was something that happened in this in this period. Uh, but what's really striking about this composition is is first of all Mount Fuji in the background there. It's it's just you know it's it's so big and tall and powerful that it's actually thrust up out of the frame of the picture, right? It's breaking the frame uh, of the picture, as it were. Uh, and then this the the sort of mountains in front of Fuji are uh, just really striking. I mean they're. <clears throat> they're all they're done all in you know grays and blacks and they're they're almost geometrical right uh, in their look um, they you know all sharp hard angles and uh, you know kind of um, you know uh, stark gray and black um, and uh, you know so it's 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 a it's a picture of nature but done in in you know uh, you know very artificial geometric kind of uh, uh, um, uh, lines as it were. <clears throat> okay, so uh, this, these um, prints were actually became 
um, strangely enough, very, very influential in the West and Western art in the 19th century. Um, uh, so there was, as, as you may know, at this time, Japan was closed off to any kind of intercourse with the West, except for a a single Dutch mission, which was allowed to send like one or two ships a year. And the Dutch actually did collect some of these, these images, the, the, the Dutch captain of the, of the mission, uh, but also these, um, these things came to Europe as packing material. And again, these were prints, right? I mean, they're beautiful, but they were, they were mass produced consumer art, right? <clears throat> and, um, so sometimes, you know, people would buy it and be like, oh, this looks really cool, but then they'd be done with it and they would, you know, use it for something else. And uh, um, sometimes they were, you know, used as packing material for the, the vases and the silks and things like that, um, that, was, that were sent to Europe on these ships, these Dutch ships. And people in, in, in Europe would, you know, see these, uh, these, these, you know, things, they would uncrumple them as it were and think, wow, this looks actually pretty cool. Uh, and sometimes they would, you know, assemble them into books and sell them in bookstores and things like that. And so they became uh, uh, <clears throat> widely uh, influential in the Impressionist art movement. Uh, Monet, Manet, Van Gogh, I think uh, Monet had 250 of these, these landscape prints in his possession. Van Gogh, uh, was so you know taken with with ukiyo-e with with uh, especially Hiroshige that he even did his own homage right um, uh, just you know because he was so kind of struck by this print and so taken with it he wanted to kind of recreate it in his own style with his own brush and he even sort of you know uh, wrote Japanese characters around the around the, the edge. Of course, he, he you know, couldn't read them at all, but he was, he was just so taken with it. He wanted to kind of recreate the whole, the whole experience as it were. <clears throat> um, this is a, a very, very general and imprecise statement and any specialist will throw a fit if they hear it, but I'm gonna say it anyway as a kind of useful guide. Um, for many centuries, European art had been, had been chasing realism, right? <clears throat> chasing ways to, to depict scenes more realistically, more like photographs. They didn't have, of course, photographs to compare it to, but um, chasing realism, right? Trying, trying to mimic reality more and more closely. Uh, so seeing these prints from Japan, which again, didn't really care about, about realism, um, which were perfectly fine making geometric mountains and, and you know, slender figures and, and using flat areas of color and so on and so forth uh, to instead, you know, give off an, uh, an, an, an artist's, um, you know, impression. Seeing this stuff was, was you know, had a, had a very powerful effect on, on uh, European artists at the time and kind of, you know, showed them a way out of, of, of you know, pursuing realism. <clears throat> uh, and so, you know, I, it's, it's not like that these prints started the Impressionist movement, but they were hugely influential in the Impressionist movement. Um, um, and, you know, artists looked at their compositions and, and looked at Japanese artists' use of, uh, you know, economy of line, especially economy of depicting faces and things like that as a way to, to sort of convey artists' impression rather than being overly concerned about mimicking reality. <clears throat> okay, so I want to end by talking about uh, printing in the modern period. Um, so in 1868, uh, of course, um, as, as you may know, um, Japan entered its, its modern period, uh, thanks to American Commodore Perry visiting. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so they, um, you know, set up on a rapid course of industrialization, um, you know, science and technology advancement. Um, and, <clears throat> but, you know, getting trains and industry and all, all kinds of stuff like that. But not only did they kind of import industry and science and technology from the West, but also uh, culture. And so woodblock printing fell out of favor for a long time. Uh, Japanese artists began to use Western forms. And so, you know, began to, to paint with oils, oil painting, um, just like Westerners were. Uh, so here's a, you know, here's a, here's an example of a, of a um, early 20th century oil painting, um, you know, using chiaroscuro and all the, all the sort of, uh, you know, techniques of, of Western artists, you know, participating in the, the Impressionist movement, just like people in the West were. Actually, this guy, Umehara, was, um, 
<clears throat> he traveled to Europe and, and uh, uh, became Renoir's favorite, favorite pupil. Uh, you know, so people, the artists were kind of absorbing Western techniques. They were even going to the West and, and studying with, with, with Western masters and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, eventually, kind of in the 1920s, people started to kind of go back and say, well, you know, maybe this, this woodblock printing was, was valuable and, and interesting and artistic after all, and they begin to kind of try to revive the form. <clears throat> um, but they, they did it uh, with a new kind of aesthetic sensibility um, uh, that, you know, sort of borrowed a lot from Western art, but still trying to preserve the kind of techniques and, and aesthetics uh, and compositions from, from um, tradition. So, uh, you know, here's a, a early example from the 1920s. The, the use of kind of pinks here is, is a pigment you would not often see in, uh, in traditional compositions, right? So, you know, he's, he's but it's, it's, also, it's, it's also still obviously a woodblock print, right? Um, so using this, this uh, you know, those older techniques, but with a kind of new aesthetic sensibility. They would talk about, uh, they would depict modern subjects like the stone bridge at Nihonbashi on the left here, or the Taj Mahal on the right here. Um, I mean, the, the Taj Mahal, of course, isn't modern, but um, it, it, it was the modern period before anyone in Japan saw it. Um, <clears throat> so they would, you know, talk about modern subjects, uh, you know, modern topics, they would depict those things. Uh, but even when they, they depicted, you know, traditional subjects, they would, you know, just uh, have a very different aesthetic sensibility. They also used um, far more wooden blocks to, to sort of uh, create this new aesthetic sense. So obviously what's remarkable about this particular picture is the dappling of the leaves. But uh, if you think about it, you know, each area of light and shadow has to be its own color, right? So there's, you know, there's these stone flagstones and the, when they're in the light, that's one color. And then when they're in the shadow, that's another color. This red pillar, light is one color, shadow is another color, and so on and so forth, right? So they use far more wooden blocks to create, um, uh, you know, a, a, a greater aesthetic, maybe not greater, but a, a different, more modern kind of aesthetic sensibility. Um, they still use flat area of colors for, for people, um, you know, maintain that traditional flatness. <clears throat> but paid much more attention to uh, the composition of the face and especially to the gaze. And this is a, a, one of those kind of aesthetics from Western art that were adopted and then reincorporated back into these new, uh, this new, uh, you know, new woodblock uh, um, aesthetics. Um, you know, the use of electric lights uh, and things like that to, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of create this new kind of sensibility of light and shadow. And, and they did use, uh, they started to use chiaroscuro, not so much in people, in faces, but in landscapes. Um, so here, uh, for instance, you can see the light is coming from somewhere off to our left. Uh, so like on this house, this uh, portion of the roof is lit and then the ridge pole is in shadow. And then this part of the roof is in a little bit less shadow. All of this, again, creating this, this real sense of dimensionality, almost making it pop off the page, right? But in, in some regards, it's still a very traditional, uh, you know, ukiyo-e landscape print. Landscape is the Mount Fuji is dominating. The people are, are very small and insignificant in comparison and, and very sort of, um, uh, uh, you know, drawn without a lot of detail uh, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and so now we're at the point where people are actually kind of playing with this, with this legacy. Um, what is a famous contemporary artist. And here he's taking a very um, uh, traditional composition, um, you know, Mount Fuji with some pine trees, but he's putting in it these kind of cartoony monster characters, which by the way, are still flat, right? They still use flat color, but they're obviously, you know, kind of modern cartoon characters. Um, <clears throat> so people are, you know, sort of taking this tradition of, of woodblock art and traditional composition and kind of, you know, playing with it and, and inserting modern um, stuff into it and things like that. Okay, I think I've probably gone well over time, so I will stop there uh, and just say thank you. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the talk and I'm happy to answer, if I can, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, great, thank you so much for that. Uh, I'm gonna, we still have time. We didn't, <laughs> it's 10.57, but if, if you're okay staying a little later, 
Uh, I know that there have been some uh, a comment sent in the chat, um, and I would like to throw it just over to quickly to Laura Burns to see if uh, you had anything to add or, or to comment, and then we can kind of transition into the Q and A section. Oh, I thoroughly enjoyed this talk, and uh, you know, you, I, I learned a lot of new things as I imagine if you did. You sort of put it in a good perspective, the way that I hadn't seen before. So I really do appreciate that. I'm leaving it up to you to answer the questions. Okay. So thank <laughs> you now, Chris, do your thing. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I I guess I don't know how you want to do this, um, but I can handle calling on the people and whatnot. Uh, okay, that's okay with you. Yeah. Please. Uh, so uh, again, if you have a question, don't just unmute and chat it out. Please click the raise hand function or feel free to send in the chat. I jump in between both of those. Uh, so for example, right now, I see that we have a comment from Richard Petway. Uh, yes, um, gozaimashita. <laughs> <clears throat> I guess I wanted to delve more into Yukioi, the floating uh, world, um, mm -hmm. because this is a unique period of um, uh, their everyday lives uh, in this late feudalistic period mm -hmm. uh, were very uh, complicated by structure of uh, samurai at the top and merchants at the bottom mm -hmm. but the merchants uh, had most of the money yes uh, <laughs> and so it was uh, <clears throat> a floating world in in some sense mm -hmm. that uh, it was unrealistic uh, when they would go to kabuki when they would go to um uh, uh basho when they would go to uh, uh, uh the pleasure quarters, mm -hmm. uh, they, they were living outside of the structure of uh, rigid, um, uh, 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 even censorship. There were no uh, women in Kabuki allowed. They were all men uh, actors. Uh, so it was a very kind of restricted life, but it seemed like that in the evenings, um, uh, pleasure came, and so they were kind of floating uh, as uh, um, out of a, a temporary period uh, that was not ordinary uh, during their ordinary lives. They would be working, they would be falling within the strict structures uh, of uh, the uh, damios or the uh, that they uh, lived with and served. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically, the the uh, type of money uh, flowed uh, from the amount of rice that each of the prefectures and demios. So uh, a person would, uh, a normal worker would get so many koku of rice, which was uh, rice to that one person uh, could eat uh, mm -hmm. in a year. <clears throat> that would be some kind of allotment system. They did have uh, mm -hmm. material uh, money. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and another thing I want to talk about is uh, uh, the Chinese and the Japanese write on their paintings, which is uh, uh, a very unique uh, uh, thought about quality to be able to put a poem um, uh, uh, or a uh, the author's view uh, in in words. So you'll get um, during this period uh, that you will get the scene. Uh, you will get the author signature, his hanku uh, or chop uh, uh, that identifies him personally, and also the publisher. Uh, there may be mentions of the carver. This was a uh, combined uh, team mm -hmm. of uh, as many as six people uh, because you got to cue all those wood blocks when you print them because they are, each have a color mm -hmm. and so they have to be queued up in, in a, a particular order that they always uh, keep the lines the same. Um, 
So it was a kind of a hard working area uh, during the day. So the letting off steam uh, during this float was similar to kind of floating uh, an unrealistic world that they would go to uh, pleasure quarters and others. Um, and even going to a basho, a, a sumo, sumo uh, contest was uh, a, a party. They would be uh, those booths uh, that you showed um, would be filled with people enjoying uh, sake and enjoying conversation, mm -hmm. unlike their usual life. At least that's one way. And I was thinking about how you might uh, give a different interpretation or the same interpretation or comment about this particular unique period. It also comes uh, uh, at the end of the Tokugawa shogunate and, and a, a revolution to go back to uh, the Meiji Revolution occurs at the end of this period. So uh, it's, a, it's a peculiar, interesting period that you began with the Battle of Sekigahara and, and, uh, and ended with uh, the Meiji Restoration mm -hmm. uh, that most of these prints, uh, well, they continue to be made, of course, but uh, the Yukio E uh, um, period was uh, um, uh, during uh, this remainder of feudalism and then the transfer to a modern uh, country. I don't think the Yukio period, the floating period, continued much into the Meiji Restoration, but I could be wrong. I'll look, see what your comments are about this unique period. Yeah. Um, so the, the 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 Edo period is is very unique and interesting. Um, <clears throat> I call it again the early modern period to emphasize. Uh, you know how how similar it is in so many ways to to our modern culture. Again, kind of proto capitalism, high rates of literacy, consumer markets. You know, actors that are that are you know huge celebrities and things like that. Culturally, many ways similar to our own. But you're right. Um, um, you know, this 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 was a feudal period. Uh, the 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 shogun and the various feud, uh, feudal lords exercised all the political power. Right, so one thing that's that's missing from these forms of art is is politics, right? Is is, is protest um, because that that just wasn't allowed. Um, <clears throat> and on the on the rare occasion something slipped through, through the, the 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 shogun censors, um, those those artists and, and authors were were harshly punished. Um, but in general, I'd, I'd say that um, the 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 level of control and censorship was not consistent. Uh, so. Um, the shogun and, and especially the, the daimyo, the, the regional lords, were exercised just very um, almost cruel, strict control over peasants because um, all their all the, the samurai's income came from agriculture, agricultural taxes. So they, they were really concerned about the lives of peasants and, and because they wanted to make sure they weren't doing anything, you know, non-productive, right? They wanted to, all their energy to be uh, going into producing more rice. So they would, they would mandate what time people had to get up in the morning and go to bed at night and what they could wear and so on and so forth. But <clears throat> that sort of strict control was, um, there was less of it in the cities, uh, you know, for the urban commoners. Um, and there, there were periods of great, la you know, kind of laxitude, right, where uh, the, the shoguns were kind of like, ah, whatever, right. Um, and, and things that even kind of made fun of samurai were, were allowed to put, be put on stage and to publish and things like that. And then followed by often like reforms and crackdowns where, where you know, such things were, were um, you know, banned very strictly. <clears throat> um, so uh, yes, there, there was this kind of strict control and many people have said that, you know, this, these, um, uh, the kind of nightlife or, or the world of Kabuki and things like that were, were ways of, of kind of, you know, blowing off steam or something or mo momentary escape from this, this, uh, this, you know, very strictly regulated life. And I, I, I think that's definitely, that's definitely, you know, true to some extent. Um, <clears throat> 
but also I think it's also uh, again a, a, a result of kind of economic and cultural developments, right? Um, that when you when you get to a certain of level of prosperity, when you have you know disposable income, all of a sudden, uh, and you have printing. Uh, you have a consumer market where people want to, you know, have the money to buy leisure goods, uh, and you have printers that, you know, want to make money off selling uh, uh, things that they print, and they, they sort of want to meet that need for for leisure goods to make money. Um, that's when you. That's really what what gets you this kind of early modern um, culture, as it were. And then uh, just uh, I think your, your last point. Yeah. So. Um, this, this all kind of, and you know, so this, this whole system was full of contradictions that I don't have a lot of time to go on for hours, but um, uh, the, yeah, I mean, the merchants were supposed to be at, at, at the bottom of this kind of caste hierarchy that was established, the samurai on top, but the merchants always had more money than the samurai. Um, the, the, the samurai got all their money from agriculture, but the economy was growing beyond agriculture. Uh, so they constantly had to borrow money from the merchants, right? This whole thing was full of contradictions. But it was also very stable, um, nonetheless, until the American Commodore Perry showed up uh, and, and basically, you know, kind of strong armed the shogun in, into opening Japan to the West. Uh, <clears throat> what followed was a, um, a, a, you know, very interesting, they call it the restoration because they, they basically two feudal domains, right? So there, were, there was never kind of any uprising by commoners, but two feudal domains. Uh, which are very strong, ousted the shogun and uh, rather than sort of take over themselves as new shogun, they, they restored the emperor to power. And the emperor had always kind of been there waiting in the wings, um, you know, composing poetry and with as many concubines and not really doing anything, exercising any political power, but that was their kind of legitimation for, uh, for, for kicking out the shogun. They said, well, we're gonna restore the emperor to power and the emperor was always the more legitimate sovereign. Um, and they did that in response to kind of the shogun's perceived inability to deal with the Western threat, with the foreign threat. Uh, and then they, the, that launched Japan's, the, the, the new government then, the new imperial government launched Japan's sort of breakneck modernization. Uh, so yeah, um, and <clears throat> then, then we have the adoption of new technologies. We get movable type printing, metal movable type printing. Um, so woodblock printing, the technology starts to fall out of favor. Uh, we get copper plate, you know, in, in, engraved printing, right? So this this era of the primacy of ukiyo-e begins to disappear, and we get you know the adoption of kind of Western art forms. But then again, uh, later in about the twenties, we we get this kind of um, desire to revive Japanese art forms. Okay, I, again, I could talk about this for hours. Um, well. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it is. It's a fascinating period, a fascinating kind of cultural and, and, and political construction. Thank you. Uh, I, I there no one has raised their hand. I don't see any more questions in the chat. Uh, so I think this is the end of the Q and A. If, if you have been sitting on a question, now now is your chance to ask it one last time. Um, but if not, thank you so much for giving this talk today. It was. I, I also found it so, so interesting. Um, and I'm sure everyone else did too. So thank you again. Thank you. Um, so that is it. Uh, I hope everyone has a great day. And until next time, uh, have a great one. Thank you very much. Bye everyone. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Chris. Thank you.